I wanted to welcome you all to this evening's lecture, the second in the department's annual Bracken Lecture Series, which brings innovative speakers to our department each year to enrich the experience of our students. These lectures are made possible by the generous gift of John R. Bracken, head of the Penn State Department of Landscape Architecture in the 1920s to 1950s. Among our Bracken lecturers each year is the Bracken Fellow, chosen as an individual with a particular impact on the discipline of landscape architecture. Bracken Fellowship is the highest uh, recognition that our department bestows, and it comes with the gift of the Bracken Medal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, this was designed by internationally renowned sculptor and Penn State professor John Cook, the face of the medal. I don't know if you guys can see that, but um, it depicts the corona of the mountain laurel, which is the Pennsylvania state flower. And the obverse side shows the Greek deity Daphne with her head surrounded by laurel leaves. We're very happy this evening to welcome Christina Hill as our 2023 Bra Bracken Fellow. <laughs> with this medal, you join a very illustrious list of Bracken Fellows, including Ian McCart, Eric Ekbo, Martha Schwartz, Ann Spurn, Diane Jones Allen, and many others. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. I'm going to pass it over to Peter Stemple to introduce all of you. I was, I was told to speak up, which I'm perfectly capable of. <laughs> um, I'm Peter Stemple. I'm an associate uh, professor of landscape architecture uh, with a focus on water related resilience. I am the to token coastal guy here. <laughs> um, so, Christina Hill is an associate professor of landscape architecture and environmental planning and urban design at the University of California, Berkeley. She's the director of the Institute of Urban and Regional Development, previously a faculty member at MIT. University of Washington in Seattle and the University of Virginia, where she also served as chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture. Hill was a fellow of the Urban Design Institute in New York and has conducted research in Stockholm, Sweden as a Fulbright Scholar. She earned her doctorate from Harvard University. Christina Hill maintains a unique profile among landscape architects engaged in climate adaptation. She was part of an international team that addressed planning for water management in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. She's worked in, new, in numerous coastal communities in US cities, advises several US federal agencies and the Rockefeller Foundation. Bill's book, Ecology and Design Frameworks for Learning was published by Island Press in 2002. And her current book proposes adapting urban waterfronts to climate change by incorporating productive ecosystems. She was featured in the documentary about urban flooding titled Sinking Cities on PBS, as well uh, as a national NPR program, Hidden Brain. I highly recommend that. It was an excellent, uh, excellent program. With research focus on adaptation to coastal flooding and climate change, Hill employs an approach that includes groundwater mapping and use of adaptation pathways to ask, how do we get there from here? She's visibly bent at the table demonstrating a role for landscape architects and climate adaptation issues before many people even realized there was a table. Um, and I'll just say, as someone who's engaged in uh, coastal adaptation, I found this team to be incredibly generous and also someone who seems to be a step ahead. My students know that I always tell them, don't look out at the ocean, look down at your feet, because the water might be coming from beneath you. And I think that that's what Christina's here to talk about to us about today. So I want to offer a very warm welcome to Christina Hill, who's been a real inspiration for me and a lot of my colleagues. Thanks. Great. It was funny to be on that uh, Hidden Brain podcast because um, we went afterwards to the dentist or something, and the dentist said, he asked me what I did, and I said, I work on the top of the floor, but I said, I just heard this really interesting person on the radio who works on that. That's how it works. So I want to talk today about what's underground, and because I'm working on a book, I probably went a little too in-depth about some of this, no pun intended, but I'm trying to connect it to some bigger ideas. Um, I think because of the 
kind of psychological toll that this kind of work takes on people. It's all anticipating a more difficult future. So underground. Um, let's see if I can advance this. Yes, this way. Okay. And I wanted to confess that my family is from here, from Music, right near Scranton. So um, I grew up looking at a picture like this of Music, Pennsylvania. And my grandmother's house was right there in the coal mine. My great-grandfather was a, a blacksmith at a coal mine in music. So there you go, I am from here. And this kind of image is the kind of image I studied when I was developing my way of looking at the world. It's very similar to that photograph. It's not the Lackawanna River, but it's a tilted limestone, shale, sandstone landscape. And it's from a terrific book called Terrain Analysis from the 70s, which I highly recommend if anybody wants to have a kind of geologist's view of landscape uh, for planning purposes, design purposes. So I wanted to show, this is the classic version of how to look at the surface and the underground together and from a geological science perspective. Since the 19th century, this is the kind of drawing we've been using. And um, I wanted to share with you, I went to uh, teach a summer class in Vienna in Austria last summer, and um, I had the students do an exercise where we did a sort of, you know, the beautiful corpse exercise that the surrealists did, passing a paper around and adding pieces blindly. Uh, the students had a piece of paper that was folded. This pair on the left would have been folded so that they couldn't see what the other person had just drawn. And they were asked to do a dystopia above ground and a dystopia below ground. So that's the diagonal pairs. And then a dystopia, a utopia below ground and a utopia above ground. And working with European students, Chicago or New York is their dystopia above ground. And their dystopia below ground includes things like unexploded bombs. You don't see that in a lot of American processes. <laughs> uh, sweet traditional buildings on the right on the utopia and all kinds of underground rivers and fungi and functioning subways and things like that in the underground, or well-organized utopian underground. So we're trying to talk about how imaginations, our imaginations often place scary things in the underground. We try to flip that. This pair of students actually introduced a mass grave in the underground. Also not something you typically see in American processions. And then a nuclear war in the Utopian, I'm oh, sorry, that's supposed to be dystopian, above ground. I flip those on that side. I think the students just put them. So the subway is the utopian underground, and the nuclear war is the dystopian above ground. Um, but it really raised a lot of new questions for me about the history of the way people have thought about the underground and the way we use it um, in our imagination to represent a place that monsters come from, whether it's below the skin of the earth or below the skin of the body. And it makes me think of uh, Donna Haraway has used this story of Cthulhu from H.P. Lovecraft to talk about the Cthulhu scene. Um, and then, of course, all endless movies with things like it came from below, uh, talking about similar things. The original um, science fiction novel by uh, Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, used this image of a monster that was brought to life by a scientist using lightning. That was a thing at the time. That was in 1818 or so. That was a theme in research. Um, luckily, it didn't work. And uh, she was talking about the way that we create monsters. We create things that we don't take responsibility for. And if you remember the original Frankenstein story, the doctor creates the monster, doesn't like the way it looks, finds it disgusting because you can see the veins under the skin. Um, and it's huge. And the monster asks to be given a mate, like sort of Adam and Eve. Um, and the doctor refuses to make another one. And so the monster goes around killing everyone the doctor loved. I think that's a really good um, metaphor for the way we create things that we don't make a relationship with. We don't have compassion for the things that we've done that were often mistakes or didn't go well in any case. Um, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. 
Um, the classic Greek gods, I'm happy to have a uh, list of Daphne on the middle. Medusa, different character, different story. <laughs> One of the, the Chthonic gods, and Chthon in Greek, the root word, I don't speak Greek, but apparently it means earth. And so it refers to the gods that were fallen gods, did something wrong, lost a battle, and ended up being associated with the underworld. So the idea of Cthulhu and Donna Haraway's Cthulhu scene and the chronic gods all connected to the idea of things underground. And of course, this is a very old idea. A metaphor, um, the myth of the half man, half moon creature that lived in a labyrinth under the palace at Knossos. Uh, that's an amazing story and goes back to 500 BC and older BCE. And then even older stories, this one is an amulet, this image is of an amulet from uh, about 2000 BCE, so about 4,000 years ago, with a scary monster called Mama Shu, who um, would, in Mesopotamian culture, kill babies, that was its main, her main role. She had the head of a lion, hairy body, and claws. She would take babies out of their bodies. So you can imagine people explaining infant mortality or um, you know, miscarriage or other kinds of things using this idea of a, a scary god from, uh, from underground that would take these um, babies. And then, of course, the classic. I won't linger on this. I don't want to you know, upset anyone. I should give a little warning. Mom, just come from inside the body, too. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the scales of space and time, and this is what I'm really interested in about the monster story and how old it is. I think that the scales of space and time have changed in just the last few years. And my example of a monster is from the human microbiome now. Uh, this is an image of uh, bacteria that live inside the human body. And you know only about 50% of your cells are human at all. So you're already this weird hybrid, not quite as crazy as Lama Shu, but you're definitely, you know, part one thing and part another, about 50%. And that's a generous estimate. It could be 10 to 1, depending on whether you include red blood cells or not. Since the pandemic, when we saw a virus spread all around the planet, from body to body, airport to airport, and now, of course, to animals, I understand the deer here was talking to on the back of the uh, quite commonly have uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Um, we're actually co-evolving in real time with this global virus. So we're a hybrid of us and the virus. The virus is constantly changing. We're both host and changing with it um, with a kind of reciprocity that again, Haraway talks about. And I think this is an example of an accelerated unintentional reciprocity that effectively collapses space. Now that humans live all over the planet and have airports that connect us, we're both extremely widely distributed and extremely interconnected with each other. So a disease that would have died out when somebody got it from eating bush meat um, in you know 50 years ago now spreads to a city from a rural area and from that city by airports all over the world. And I don't have to tell you that story because you know that. But it has weirdly collapsed the globe into a series of airports where diseases spread, especially respiratory diseases. So we're no longer as big as we used to be as a planet. That spatial scale has collapsed. And then the temporal scale, I think, has been collapsed um, by the way that we model the future. And I'm going to call it a present future, what we live in now, because we know that over the last 100,000 years or so, um, and over the last million years, which this graph from NASA shows, CO2 in the atmosphere has varied a lot. But in the last short amount of time, 10,000 years, 5,000 years, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has doubled past any amount that existed in the last million years or so. So we're already on a new planet. And now we're talking about where that's going to go next, what the next level of it will be, the oldest cities on this time scale are right there in Mesopotamia when Lamashu was scaring everybody. 
Um, and it's amazing how short a time humans have been around, but we were not around the last time CO2 was this high. And when we look at projection models for the climate, we're looking at today. So there's our present, those dots on the black line there, including 2022 as the latest year that's been uh, assessed. As we use all that carbon, we're on one of these roller coaster rides to a future global temperature. And we don't know which one, but there's a definite pairing now between where we are today in terms of how much CO2 we emit and where we're going to be at that magical unicorn year of 2100. So our present and our future are like all the space between them has been taken away. And everything we do today is determining that future. They are paired as if there's a rope between them. And there's some variability in how this is all going to play out. But even where we are now, that path to minus two degrees is looking real unlikely. So we're talking about an average global temperature anomaly for comparing to pre industrial times of probably three degrees. And that's going to be disastrous for sea level rise and fire and lots of other things. So I'm, you know, soberly looking at that um, and thinking about the way that we got here. So this illustration from 1556 talks about mining in Europe. This was the text. If you're interested in metallurgy or mining or the use of metals, this was the text. Well, it was the primary text for almost 200 years. Paintings like this one from that same period by Peter Brugel show the, in this, in this case, Mad May one of my favorite characters from art history, and she is actually uh, pillaging or ransacking the gates of hell. So going underground to steal stuff from hell. Who would have thought of that? But it's a woman who's crazy enough to go to the gates of hell and steal things. And it just says again to me how we have this relationship with the underground in our imagination and actually in coal mines with the Carboniferous period. So this is a coal mine where they discovered a fossilized tree stump in the mine and then cut all the coal and uh, shale away from it. That tree is from the Carboniferous forest of 300, 400 plus million years ago. That tree stump. So the, the, the funny thing about using coal and mining it is that we built this relationship a reciprocity like with the virus, but this time with plants and animals from 300 million years ago. And we did that in a way that allowed us to increase the energy density of the fuels we use. We were on track to find things that were more portable and contained more potential energy for us to use. So we started with wood, we got to coal, we did oil, to methane gas, very rapidly increasing the energy density of our fossil fuels building this relationship with animals that no longer exist and plants that no longer exist and basically releasing them into the world burning their remains and releasing them if i had said to you let's dig up an animal from 300 million years ago and release it into the environment jurassic park style that probably seemed like a bad idea and in fact it has been a really bad idea in pursuit of this energy density so um, that is what's going to drive our sea level higher. And this is the history of change in sea level over the last 24,000 years. And if you can see the rate was super high about uh, 14,000 years ago at everyone's favorite pulse, meltwater pulse 1A, which everyone's afraid is once in our future, very steep increase in sea level. And then the first cities actually appeared just as sea level began to slow down in its rise and uh, deltas formed because all that sediment is being carried down to a shoreline in the same spot for a long time. And then cities appear on those deltas. This is what some people think is the first city, um, the city of Eridu. And the god who founded that city in the mythology of the people of Mesopotamia, coming back to Lamashu again, uh, was Enki, who was the god of groundwater. The people who lived in Mesopotamia were fascinated by groundwater and they felt their myth was that humans originate in groundwater underground come up while they're alive and then after they die they go back to the groundwater and live underground with Enki. 
and their cities were surrounded by waterways and canals. This artist rendering doesn't really do that justice, but there were canals and levees and irrigation systems were very complex, and they all depended on that very shallow water too. If they hadn't been there, they wouldn't have been able to get around by boat. They wouldn't have been able to irrigate during the dry seasons. So this origin of cities depended on a high water table. Humans have been here before. Rapid sea level rise, making cities because the land around the valley dried out. So now we're to the Dutch. We just zoom from Mesopotamia to the Dutch, who are living the beginning of that rising sea level and how to adapt before the rest of us because their land is so low and they are absolutely committed to not moving to Germany. <laughs> their plan is to stay. So they point out that, that flooding is going to come from all four of these directions. And they have worked with this high groundwater in their cities like Amsterdam since the 17th century and before, where they built canals as a way to drain groundwater out of the surrounding soil to wick it out by pumping the water a little bit in the canal. So that's how cities like Amsterdam could exist in a high water table condition on a delta, in this case, the Rhine River Delta. And they're now building floating structures. These are fixed piers, and that big bar building in the back is fixed. And all the rest of these structures, except I think one four-story one, are all uh, floating, and except that the building's on that levee in the front there. But the interior of the triangle is all floating. And that's, I think, what our future situation is going to require us to do, to think about how to combine um, locally built or prefabricated units or relocated units onto uh, some kind of a floating landscape. This is a, a similar landscape in Almera. And uh, it just shows, you can see how high their water table is right there. But they choose to do it in a place where it's, uh, separated from the open ocean. They dig a hole and they put floating shared decking in there, or they build uh, with shallow you know, foundations, depending on what kind of environment they're in. So I want to show you what's going to happen, just to give you a visual of how groundwater rise works with sea level rise. And in this illustration, you can see there's a levee, there's a marsh, there's a road, there's a parking lot that's used to cap old contaminated soils, which we've done a lot all around the country and around the world. And there's a pipe underground. There's fresh groundwater. There's a mixing zone of fresh and salt, and there's salted water. And the ocean extends under the land in a surprising, to a surprising degree. And it's like having your toe under a pillow on the couch. As the ocean rises, it's going to push that freshwater groundwater up. So you can see there the ocean water just come up a little bit. Now there's infiltration in that pipe. The creek is getting water in it. The groundwater is rising in the contaminated soil under the parking lot. It's not lined from below. It's just capped from above. All these scary things are coming up from underground. The chthonic world of hydrology, and it's going to alter the way that we use cities eventually showing up as surface flooding, emergent flooding. But by the time it gets to the surface, a lot of things have already happened. So my work right now is all about identifying those early impacts and helping people be ready because there are some very serious health uh, issues related to the early impacts. And all of this happens in spite of the levy. So it's also possible that people could build very expensive billions of dollars in levy systems and then flood from behind and below anyway. And that's what I really want to prevent. Because if we spend a couple billion dollars in the San Francisco Bay area to build levees, and then we flood anyway, that's a huge waste of adaptation capacity. So what I work on is understanding um, these black dots in relation to the blue. Those are contaminated sites that have been capped typically from above. So that everything from clay to concrete and there are many of them, 8,000 in the Bay Area alone over groundwater that's less than three meters or about 10 feet deep. And the waste is about that deep in many cases. It's from a leaky underground oil storage tank, gas storage tank, which is already, the top of it was buried three feet down, the bottom of it, of it is easily eight feet down. And then the leakage 
of petroleum is a good 10 feet down. So inches of change in the groundwater table is going to cause problems for those contaminated sites, at those contaminated sites. This is one community I'm looking at, in particular Richmond, and I'll show you an example at a site scale of what's happening in that cluster of black dots at the southern edge of that uh, shoreline. This was a chemical factory, the Stouffer Chemical Factory, and it was sold. They manufactured everything. They played with radioactivity. They had uranium on site. This was the 1940s. They made herbicides. They made gunpowder. They made sulfuric acid. They made uh, all kinds of chemicals, organic chemicals there. And then they sold it to AstraZeneca, a company you've probably heard of in relation to our co-evolution with the virus. Um, a deep pocket company that now owns that site looks like this. That's the cap, that grayish white flat space. They mounted um, material, uh, treated cinders from the site, and then they flattened that mound, bulldozers, and they sealed it with what looks like kind of rice crispy candy stuff, uh, pretty a little bit porous enough to let it degrade somewhat over time, which was the goal. And these lagoons, this is high tide at an extra high tide of the year, not a storm, but a kind of tide level that happens three or four times a year. And you can see the old chemical lagoons there are ponds. They're connected hydrologically to the bay. And all of the things that have run out into that wetland over the last hundred years are also connected hydrologically to the bay. There are fish in that mud um, that have both male and female sex organs and tumors throughout their bodies. So this is a highly polluted landscape. My students are making uh, what we call wet models, and I'll just show you this one, where they can demonstrate to the public uh, what's happening with these contaminated sites. And this one shows um, contaminants. It's ink on a tissue paper in that box underneath the building. And as the water rises on the seaside, which is beyond the seawall, you can see that the water rises behind the seawall, which is pretty much what will happen. Um, and then as it passes through that contaminated tissue paper and makes its way into the basement or the first floor of the building, you can start to see black ink make its way into the building. So we're trying to use these wet models to explain to the public how contaminants are going to rise and move around as groundwater rises in unexpected ways. Uh, this is that AstraZeneca site from the from above the map, and that section A A prime, I think it is, um, the one that goes left to right across this image. Uh, this looks like this, and of course they exaggerate the vertical; it's not that high. But um, yeah, I've added those pink ellipses to try to say that that's where contaminants have been detected, and the groundwater table is that peak dash on. So the contaminants at this site that has some really horrible chemicals at it, there's basically any horrible chemical you can think of is there, um, are being detected. And I'm showing symmetrical ellipses, but this is actually flow in the water table. And many of the chemicals are lighter than water, so they're flowing on the surface of that water table. If we looked at it in map view, we would see those uh, places where monitoring wells have detected chemicals, have allowed us to know that chemicals are there in scary concentrations. And then these black lines are showing the directions of flow in today's environment. And as sea level rises, those flow directions can change. They're likely to move more laterally, for instance, as the sea level rises and blocks them from flowing directly out. And those brown lines are sewer lines. And what's important about that is that underground, when a ball of organic chemical that has gas phase, has gas component, crosses a sewer line, that's where we normally expect for all these things to flow downhill on the water table and into a creek or into the ocean. When it crosses a sewer line and enters the sewer line, or just enters the backfill around the sewer line, the gas travels uphill and the liquid travels down. So the smell of petroleum you get at a gas station, that's all organic chemical. 
That's one of the chemicals that's here. And you can see these fine black lines crossing the brown sewer lines. All of the buildings that are attached to those sewer lines are being exposed to the volatile organic chemicals in gas form as they move up the sewer line. And I had this uh, discussion with the mayor of Richmond about how toilets have a pee trap. And so sewer gases cannot enter the house. <coughs> yes, but my first job was as a janitor, so I knew exactly how toilets work. And uh, they have an internal pee trap. So the seal at the floor is where gas is entered the building, as well as places in the foundation, slab foundations that are either cracked or have plumbing entering um, or energy lines or anything else entering through the slab. So all of the buildings I'm not showing here, but they're attached to those sewer lines and they're mostly light industrial, um, are places where people in the indoor air could expose them to cancer causing chemicals. I spoke to a woman whose office was right there. She runs a cable company and running electrical cable. And uh, she's had every kind of cancer. She's had cancer maybe eight, nine times. And she had never heard from the state that manages this site that there is a gas that can enter buildings. And she has a building just up gradient from that thick set of black lines that crosses those sewer lines, attached to that sewer line. So no one has ever talked about this. Um, so I'm making it my mission to talk about it because it's going to get worse. Things that are not being moved yet by that water table with a few inches of change in the groundwater level may be moved around. So this is the first step um, to, uh, to recognize the problem. And I've had a success, which is the State Water Board in California and the State Department of Toxic Substance Control have just issued new guidance to all of their site managers that they have to pay attention to rising groundwater as part of rising sea level and do new site investigations in some cases where there are hazardous chemicals left in place to anticipate where the chemicals are going to go. So now I feel like I could retire. That would be like the high point to get a state the size of California to change its rules based on these kinds of drawings and discussions. But I'm trying to think about where we're going to go with these sites. So if we remove the contaminated soil, what we normally do now is send it to some other disadvantaged community, in our case, Kettleman City, or it might be sent by train to Wisconsin to be baked and made inert, somewhat, mostly inert. Uh, that seems really dumb to me. So I think we need to have a regional facility where we can deal with the waste or find a way to sequester it in Kingsons or something up from Massachusetts. And that's what we did in Bedford. We put hazardous soil into Kingsons and then built the harbor on top. Maybe not a great long-term idea. Um, what we need to do though is excavate these soils. We don't have time for phytoremediation or even in situ treatment. If we excavate these soils, it's going to leave a pond behind. Now you see where I'm going with this. Rich Haig once told me that the essence of landscape architecture is to dig hole and make mound. <laughs> <laughs> this was on his drawing all over a white tablecloth at the back of the club at the University of Washington uh, to describe it to me. So I think what we need to do is dig holes at contaminated sites to remove material and then make mounds with the clean stuff that comes out of that hole or make wedges really because we're trying to build bigger marshes on the edge today and then do what the Dutch do and do floating in the pond where it's safe from wave energy. So I'm going to show you a student's claymation of how this might work. This is a slightly different site, but what she's showing is groundwater under the soil and a channel that already exists there. Many of these sites have some kind of discharge channel. And then she's showing digging a hole and then seeing the groundwater uh, mounting up the edge, sorry, because you have to have some kind of levee edge around that. And then putting the, having the groundwater show up in the pond. I know it's coming. There it is. And again, I'm looking for representation tools that work with public audience. So play nation. Um, and then she's placing shared decking, which would have pontoons under it, and then placing 
prefabricated units stacked on top of that. So that you have public space and you get a kind of snowshoe effect of greater buoyancy, much better than houseboats. And then she's showing how it might uh, change over time. I'm going to skip that. And show you instead an image that was drawn for a competition where I worked with uh, people from CMG Landscape Architects and AECOM on a team to propose a way for the Bay Area in California to adapt. All this low flat land with high water tables, soon to be a lot of holes. And to use those ponds in a way that would let us float at the same time we'd have a riparian connection so we could bring water in from higher elevations to flush the ponds and allow that water to go back out again to the bay, but also receive the water from the bay as the tide comes in. And then close the gates. Like you're breathing in all the way, but you're not going to let it out all the way. Otherwise, these ponds would turn into mud flats. So it has to have a mechanical component to be able to manage the tide, uh, the tidal prism. And we want there to be a big wetland edge because we otherwise will lose all of our wetlands in the Bay Area and sea level rises. And we've restored 100,000 acres of wetland. And the world's biggest wetland restoration experiment, we don't want to lose it. So we've been looking at different representations of that form. I started using this floating uh, district idea in 2016. Uh, this is a version of a very wide wetland and a levee along the edge, even a floating soccer field. Uh, my teenager would be happy to see. And then we did some professional drawings as part of that team project in 2018. Uh, and that shows the shared decking. A thickening represents the pontoon. I think it would actually have to be even thicker. And then uh, prefabricated units on top. And then conventional buildings on the levee although they probably have to have pretty deep foundations because this is all artificial fill and we are earthquake zone so waiting for 8.5. So you can't do shallow, simple foundations. You have to do something clever and more expensive. And then we uh, work with little wet models like this to try to show people how floating works. It is amazing how many people think if you talk about floating in the Netherlands, they'll say, oh, but we can't do that. And you say, why not? Well, we don't have a metric system. <laughs> so we have conversations about how floating works and we show them and kids get to play with it and our models leak and people find us funny because our models leak. And we have to not, ha ha, look, it's perfect. Because we're working with all these low-income communities that are under incredible housing loss stress. They're you know, under incredible stress of losing their homes. So we're trying to talk about the way that we could live in these neighborhoods for longer. First with canals that would look out that high water table and then eventually replacing conventional buildings with the uh, unconventional that would have to be a land trust or some other creative financing structure to be able to offer uh, income uh, units to low income people. So I just want to leave you with this uh, thought and then open up the questions that really we're talking about monsters as a kind of demonstration. Uh, I would say a demonstration that should teach us to live in a nimbler way as we adapt to all of this and to live with compassion. I think for ourselves as well as for other people who are going to have a hard time adapting. And then that of course shallow coastal groundwater is rising even with levees. You're going to be in a meeting someday when someone proposes a levy. And it's going to be up to you to say, you know what, that's not going to work. What that works for is to keep a storm surge out that's temporary. It does not work for a permanent higher tide line, permanent higher sea level. Levies are not going to work. That's why the Dutch have an extensive network of pumps, which would be very expensive to replicate. And their land has subsided as a result of the pumping, which we do not want to have happen in other places because then you just blow it all over the sea level. And then finally, that this idea of rich kings, big bowl, and big mound, landforms will be one of the main strategies we use to adapt in coastal areas. And guess who's the best at landforms? That would be us. So there's a lot of work for landscape architects if you are brave. To point out that the engineered levees are not going to work, 
and to offer an alternative to the Holomake Mound so that we can live with this higher water and various monsters. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eliza Penny Packer, a faculty member in landscape architecture, and Peter Stemple and I are playing tag team because we are the Bracken Lecture Committee. And so I'm going to facilitate a conversation. But before we begin, I do want to say if anyone needs to leave, because you know you're busy people, go ahead and do that now. Okay, we won't make fun of you. We understand people are busy. The rest of us will have a quiet conversation with Dr. Hill. So if anybody needs to leave, go right ahead and do so, okay? Don't be shy, don't be shy. I won't take it personally. Don't go to your studio back. work. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that, everyone will be that. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> It always makes for a more relaxed conversation if we go ahead and, you know, let people who are eager go ahead and go. So, at this point, then, does anyone in the present audience have a question for Dr. Hill? Yes. Um, oh, wait, I have to give this to you. <laughs> sure. Hi, my name is Antonia. I'm a professor at Geosciences. I was just saying that we don't yet start speaking there. Try <laughs> next year. You didn't get any coordination. <laughs> we I do a lot of climate impact work on water. We talk a lot about exposure, hazards, exposure, vulnerabilities. To me, this it's more on the exposure space. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the vulnerability space. So the communities are on top of this hazard uh -huh. exposure. And our capacity to respond or adapt, even that, I guess, overlapping layer of vulnerability. Yeah, so most of the communities, not all of them, but I would say 70% of the land area that will be most affected by rising groundwater in the San Francisco Bay area, which is the only place I've studied so far, is low income people of color. So it's Latino people, African American people, and um, Asian American people who are low income and have were originally trapped in those locations by redlining. So it's not an accident. It's part of systemic racism and the design of that system. So I think we owe everyone whose land value has increased owes them something. And I hope that we'll be able to address it by. First, helping them stay in their homes, because if you disrupt by closing buildings and saying, you know, this is not safe anymore, um, it just adds to the housing dislocation problem. So we have to find a way to keep homeowners or renters in place as long as possible. That's why I think canals with light surface pumping are a decent strategy for that. But these are mostly low-income areas and older homes. Uh, pre-1950. And um, there probably are problems in multi-story buildings with the foundations where increasing in salinity can corrode foundations. So I'm also concerned about that. If that's true, if there are buildings with corroding foundations, then I think you should put a red tag on that building and close it and start over. But we have to do it with a place for people to go. Um, it's just so bad right now where I think the African-American population of Oakland was, has gone down by 50% between the 2020 census and the 20, uh, 2000 census. So over 20 years, it's gone down by 50%. The diversity of the Bay Area is rapidly decreasing as people move to Stockton and Fresno. So we need strategies that work very quickly. And that's why I would propose looking at these industrial and commercial sites. And in fact, that site I showed you, the AstraZeneca site, um, there are actually 4,000 units of housing proposed for that site. Low income housing, affordable housing on that highly polluted site. So we're getting it wrong right now. We're trying to do that housing, 
the conventional housing on contaminated site at shoreline is bad here. So it's a complicated process and it requires some creative financing that I think the state is going to have to help with because developers don't want to take the risk of not getting a permit to do something unconventional. And departments of other birds don't want to build canals. Again, they're worried that something will go wrong and they'll pollute habitat in some way, which would be a big fine. So I think I answered the question about who lives there and why it's so difficult to work around essentially housing poverty. So <clears throat> I want to encourage anybody who's visiting us online to put their uh, questions in the chat. We do have a question from an online attendee. And the online attendee asks, what is the next geographic region that this floating community concept would benefit most from? Besides the San Francisco Bay. Besides San Francisco Bay. <laughs> um, well, you need capital, I think, or you need a lot of labor. So I can imagine the low-lying places around the world that don't have money, but do have a labor force, being able to build this. I've never worked in Bangladesh, but I can imagine that they have a lot of shovels and to be able to build these ponds and do a lower tech version of floating decking and floating homes. They already do amazing floating raft uh, vegetable gardening, vegetable farms. So they're aware of floating as a strategy. Um, I think that much of the US coastline can benefit from this. The only place that there's really no strategy to address is if you live on a bluff, a soft, unconsolidated bluff above the ocean. You're going to look safe on the map. You're going to look like you're, you know, oh, I'm 50 feet above sea level. I'm fine. But those waves are going to chew that bluff away and you're going to fall. So that's unsolvable, I think, in spite of all the geo tubes and other things people are throwing at the, those bluffs. I can imagine that Miami people would use this lagoon strategy and just evacuate before the hurricane. And then when the 20 foot wall of water is gone, go back and repair the prefab houses or whatever kind of houses they built on the decking and reoccupy the lagoon. The thing is people have a struggle to understand where we might do this because they see all this developed land in coastal cities. Conventional development, I have to emphasize, is going to fail at some point. And then you have the way reduced tax base. That's not good for the city's adaptation capacity. So it would be better to act sooner on parcels where you can pilot this. And that could be in Miami, that could be in Cape Cod, in Massachusetts, that could be in coastal Virginia. Um, I think we can do this in lots of places. We just have to figure out how to keep the water quality reasonably high on the ponds. But most golf course communities have ponds and have figured out how to keep the water quality reasonably good. So it's not a difficult technology. We have another question. Yes, Alec. Sort of started to say it um, just now, but I, I really liked all these ways of visualizing just what's up on the screen. Like a lot of it's about visualizing failure or limits or, or catastrophes. And I wonder, you just mentioned. Um, it's going to happen that there'll be some kind of storm event in these floating communities. And I wonder if like with your students, you've gone through exercise of what those kinds of failures look like. Cause I think we, we think we know what a, what a flood catastrophe looks like. And I imagine there's a whole new set of visual vocabulary and terms and yeah. images that comes with these new kinds of communities. The levy that would be around the lagoon or tidal city, we've kind of marketed as in California, uh, would be designed to be low enough to be overtopped on purpose because it won't be destroyed that way. It's not going to fall over like the walls did in Rome, those razor walls. The water would come over the levee and into the pond where everything is already floating. I don't think anybody should stay in their house when a wall of water comes over the levee. But when they come back from evacuation, unlike in New Orleans or Richmond, Virginia, when people came back from evacuation and water was 10 feet deep in their neighborhood, uh, you can't occupy those houses. These houses you would be able to occupy when you came back. They wouldn't be uh, destroyed by mold. They might be, have wind damage, but that probably would be the worst of it. 
So I'm, I'm hoping we had some models of what, what it would look like when the overtopping water came in, but that particular team didn't do a very good job with the floating buildings and the buildings kind of fell apart. So maybe that would happen, but I was not satisfied with the wet model. So next year, we're going to make another version of those wet models, show people what it would look like if water overtops the lights. But I think that unless you're in a situation where there's a lot of debris coming down some coastal river, um, I think it would be fine with the levees, a low levee around it. You know, famous last words, but uh, I think it would be better than conventional buildings. You'll have to try a better model first. <laughs> and another question from the audience, the, the present audience. Well, I, I was intrigued by, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm not doing my oh, job. <laughs> I was intrigued by uh, the engagement with the community. We had just gotten having a conversation with some of the graduate students about the role of landscape architecture in, in community, um, not necessarily community building, but sort of through education or just um, information gathering. And um, sadly, landscape architects aren't well, perhaps aren't aren't the best known for those types of activities, they certainly go on. Um, but I'd like to hear what you think the value is of, of engaging the, those folks as you do and having them see that you model link and et cetera. Just what, what is the value of, of that for the project and for the, for the community understanding? Right, well, I mean, what I, the reason why I succeeded in changing state policy is because I've been out there so much with the community. And if I were, you know, doing uh, gallery shows of wet models, I wouldn't get as far. So I've been out there talking to people, and then there'll be somebody in the audience who says, "Let me show that to a state senator. Give me that video." Um, so we have a lot of conversations in person, and then the activists in the room take that part. It's like you just, you know, handed people something they can use as ammunition in conversations with elected officials or with staff. Uh, who, as soon as you say, these are Latino neighborhoods, these are African American neighborhoods, these are the ocean neighborhoods, they feel guilty that they have not done more to help prepare because they want to do good. They just haven't known how to do it. So I think that's why policies are beginning to change. There was a series done by a PBS station in our area um, when a reporter went around and talked to young activists of color in these neighborhoods and told them what I was doing, the reporter told them, and then had them comment, and that went straight to the desk of some of the heads of public agencies. So I think as long as the agencies are open, the public agencies, you can actually change the way we approach these problems by engaging with community. You just have to have people in the room who are activists in addition to residents. You can't have a meeting in the Bay Area without having an activist show up. <laughs> so it's no credit to me. That's just how it works here. If you advertise a meeting, you're going to get somebody. And if you say the wrong thing, they will pick at you at the next meeting. So you definitely have to learn. And one of the things I've seen landscape architects do that does not work well is um, this idea that good design is good design for everyone. Well, if you see something neo modern and brushed aluminum and polished granite, everyone's going to like that. That's good design. And that is not true. Uh, people in these post industrial neighborhoods, that says hipster to them, and they feel displaced just by that aesthetic moving into their neighborhood. They have an aesthetic that they want, which is rusty metal, brick. Uh, they want, they, they have a way that they want it to look, but we often don't listen. So I think we have to really reconsider what are the materials we use and even the forms that would feel welcoming to them instead of making it a place where someone's going to walk up to them and tap them on the shoulder and say, can I help you? Some white person's going to walk up to a person of color and say, can I help you in a public space? So that's why a lot of young people of color, what they've told me is they don't go to fancy new parks. They don't want to have that interaction or be followed or have someone call the police on them, which happens in the Bay Area a lot with the cultural displacement that's going on. 
So I think being in the community teaches you so much about how your models will break, um, how things will read, how to explain things. And there are terrible things that happen. One time I brought 25 students to the Black Workers Center in Oakland. There was no one there. We had all our boards and models. We made easels. We had $200 of Ethiopian food. There was no one there. So bad things can happen, but it's only because to them, I'm an extra. And to me, they're essential. So that sometimes produces bad things. So you have to cultivate your community contacts over a longer period. Be a trusted partner, not just try to you know, do it for one semester. One more question, Trinity. <laughs> My question is, um, what do you think? Oh, wait, uh, wait, okay. <laughs> um, in doing the work and working with the community, communities, um, what do you feel like the biggest challenge was um, in doing social outreach and getting like the knowledge out there about the groundwater and groundwater pollution? Um, they suspect already that their neighborhoods are polluted. I mean, they know, they can smell it. They see the traffic, they know the asthma rates. So if you tell somebody, and there's pollution in the soil, they're like, I knew it. This place is polluted. So that is the easy part. The hard part is um, helping them imagine that it's worth planning for sea level rise when they may lose their apartment this weekend. That's the real part. You have to, we did, we took my studio and went and uh, tried to address some of the things they wanted to work on. That's how you build that reciprocity. So they were trying to do, in this bigger neighborhood of East Oakland, they were trying to do a Black cultural center, Black cultural district. And we did visualization of that with them. It was not our topic, but we did it because we wanted to build that relationship. And then they were willing to come to some meetings and talk about sea level rise. And now, five, eight years later, uh, they are talking about sea level rise because other people around them are. So it's, it's kind of a, it catches on. And then it gets easier. But you can't talk about chemicals. I mean, that is a non starter. You can't talk about dye, methyl, blah, blah, blah. You can barely say VOC, all organic chemicals. Everyone's eyes glaze over. So you just have to talk about contaminants and say that stuff over and over again and say we have cancer, because that's what is associated with that. It's time for us to take Christina for a nice dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you all. Dr. Hill, thank you so much. We really appreciate it.